is um, so you've started the thing. Yep. Good. Started it. Okay. So the book I've decided to use is Anthony Z's book, Quantum Field Theory in a Nutshell, Second Edition. It's published by Princeton University Press, and um, I would guess the best way to buy it is uh, from Amazon, but I, I don't know. It, it, Who was it by? Excuse me? Who was it by? Z. Um, Sit there as long as you don't get your head in front of a camera. Um, all right, so I I put the first chapter on the web page as a PDF, um, and then you'll say, "What is the web page?" Um, I sent it to Kathy Webster. Let me guess what it is. Um, in fact, I've got an iPad here. I should be able to confirm the guess. So, or better yet, does anybody have a laptop s s sitting? Yeah. You've got one there? Is that? Yeah. Okay. So let's see if this works. Okay, this is the hard part now. I think second chapter on in uh, a couple of days. Um, yes. You can see, so this works? Yes. Um, and I can see the first chapter of the Right. And I also put here a link to the course that I taught the last time I taught it, which was 2010-2011. And um, I taught it differently then. I based the course mainly on Weinberg's book. But I think um, I think you'll find it easier to do uh, to, to, to I, th I think it'll be a better learning experience for you on um, using uh, Z's book. Um, so let me First, uh, just to lower the tension in the room, I'm a very easy grader. Um, when I teach 523, I don't think I've given anything less than A minus in a very long time. Um, on the other hand, obviously, if you do the homework, you'll learn a lot more than if you don't. And of course, we're going to be based on homework. And, um, but it, it, it will be based very generously on them. The last time I taught it was if you did homework and got most of it right, you got A+. Plus. If you did the homework and got most of it wrong, you got an A. And if you didn't do the homework, you got A-. minus. That's the way I grade the class. <laughs> <laughs> I was on sabbatical in China. Um, last year, and I tried to break a similar course that way, and the university wouldn't process my grades. Um, they said I could only give 30, I, first I couldn't give any A pluses, and I couldn't give more than 30% A's, so the others got uh, B plus. 
<laughs> then I had an undergraduate course in spring, and some of the undergraduates didn't do very well, so they got B minus or C or something. But um, so the, the the difference was that in the graduate course, the graduate course like this, I think um, that it's fair to grade pretty high uh, because the course involves concepts that are much more sophisticated than the concepts in, say, uh, ordinary quantum mechanics or ordinary hydrodynamics. So that's the motivation that I use. Also, I think frightening students doesn't uh, help them learn. Uh, and so, so I, I, that's another reason to grade high. My colleagues don't agree with me, but I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me start now with um, natural units. This is something that some of you, most of you probably already know. There are various kinds of natural units. And the kind we're going to use, we said h bar equal to c equal to 1. And c equal to 1 means that you're measuring things in light year, distances in light years. Uh, so that to make c over 1. But uh, setting h bar equal to 1 then means that you're measuring energy as a sort of funny inverse seconds or a certain funny frequency. Um, when you do this, the advantage of doing this is that the formulas that you write down don't have the damned h bars and c's all over the place. And that is actually uh, very good for you because the H bars and C's take up space in your brain. Um, and if, you, if they're not cluttering up the page, then you concentrate on the things that are important rather than these things that are ultimately conversion factors. Um, and so the question then is how do you get, if you have an answer, how do you get back to ordinary units if you have something that's, um, that's uh, that doesn't have h bars and c's, then how do you get something that's in MKS units? So I'm going to illustrate that uh, for a moment here. Obviously, if you have an M, your answer is M. Well, what can that be? That could be a mass, and then you don't have to do anything. Or it could be an energy. So then you just multiply by c squared. You see, you can take any answer and you just sprinkle it uh, with, um, it's like using salt and pepper. Um, you just sprinkle it with uh, h bars and c's until the taste is right. <laughs> okay. um, and so there it's an energy. Um, and you might have some something that's one over time, well this is a frequency, and uh, if you multiply by h bar, then h bar over time, this can be uh, an energy, or in particular if you have an angular frequency h uh, omega, h bar omega is then an energy. Um, another example, one over m, you can think of this as a length. And the way you make the length is you multiply by h bar and divide by uh, c. And the way you think about this is that if you multiply by yet another c, you get h bar c over m c squared. And um, let me see, do I have this right? So. Um, so yeah, h bar c is erg, oh no, this is a time, sorry, I've made this into a time. This is a time, because h bar c is energy times time, and I'm dividing by energy, and so I've got a time. This, on the other hand, is a length, because, what is it? It's, um, let's go back to h, it's h bar c, Uh, let me see, h bar c, uh, 
Yeah, because it's actually. I got, I got this in my notes. I have this being a time and this being a length. Um, and now do I have it wrong? Let me see. Um, No, because that's h bar is action, so M C is momentum, so it works out. Yeah, yeah. That's right. This is uh, that's right. H bar itself is action, so this is erg seconds. Good. Okay. So this is erg seconds, and um, um, so writing it like this, we've got erg seconds, so this is energy times time divided by energy times L over time, and so this is length. Okay, so that's the way that makes sense. Maybe I should do this one the same way then. This is energy times time divided by energy, so this is obviously time. Okay. All right, so as you can see, I'm still confused about natural units. Um, but uh, at, if you just sprinkle and uh, do it carefully, then, um, then it works out. One example is um, to think about uh, Newton's constant times uh, m squared over L. Well, this is an energy. And um, so consequently, if you have um, the units of G are energy length over M squared. And so if you take 1 over square root of G, but divide by H bar C. And so H bar C is erg seconds, erg, this is erg, this is energy distance. So this, so the units of this are um, 1 over square root, and then we've got EL over M squared, and now this is energy distance, so this is EL, and so this is altogether 1 over the square root of 1 over M squared, so this is altogether M. So this is, in fact, what's called Planck mass. It's then uh, 1 over the square root of g divided by h bar c, or effectively square root of h bar c over big G, big G being Newton's uh, constant. And this thing, has, uh, this is now in units of mass, and so this is, uh, let me just write it as 1.2 times 10 to the 19th g is b over c squared for, oh, 2.2 minus 8 kilograms or about 22 micrograms. So the, the plank mass is much, much heavier than an ordinary element particle. Um, so that's an illustration of natural units. You can, uh, as, as I said, if you uh, sprinkle it with H bars and C's, you can sprinkle because they're just one. And so you just season with H bars and C's until you have the units right and then you then you go back to MKS units and you get whatever it is you want. Alright, now Z's units aren't quite the ones I would have used. Um, although they're ones that well, as you know this For the metric of flat space time, you can have plus, minus, 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 or minus, plus, plus, plus. Weinberg uses this, and um, but Z somewhat unfortunately made that choice. Um, it, it has the advantage, this choice has the advantage that P squared is then, um, m squared, so it's it's positive, that is to say, it's e squared minus the momentum squared, which in natural units is just 
Tim Square. So that's the advantage of it. That's why he does it. But Weinberg thing is a little more sensible because uh, if you have two different points, then and if they have the same, then this is x minus y vector squared minus x zero y zero. So um, no, I don't have that. It's x zero x zero minus y zero squared. Um, then for when the times are the same and the space points are different, then you have a positive distance. So this is the this is this metric here. And for general relativity, that's the better choice. For particle physics, Z's is probably the better choice. Anyway, so you have two four vectors, A, B, A dot B, and Z's notation is A0, B0 minus A dot B. And another quantity that will occur a lot is if you have some function of space-time and then you take the derivatives, um, you can take a, the Lorentz inner product of the two derivatives then is, is the time derivative of B squared minus the gradient of B squared. So this is the way it is in, in, in um, Z's notation. And um, sometimes this is written as, let me see, well, you can also write this in terms of this space-time metric. It's a to a b, d a v, d b v. I sometimes try to use Latin rather than Greek indices because we're not Greek, um, and again, Greek letters it takes up, they take up space in the brain. Um, and on the other hand, if we were Greek easier to use the Greek letters. Um, but um, Z doesn't do this. Z uses Greek letters for uh, zero to uh, three. And eta, a, b then is uh, one minus one minus one minus one zero. So okay, so these are the, these are the, initial remarks. Uh, I'm going to now start uh, follow Z's treatment of path integrals. Um, first, in the very simplest context of one of the paths. And um, you probably have seen this, uh, but how many have seen path integrals? Sort of some, but not all. It's it's a subject that it's a subject that still is not really well understood, and consequently is is interesting. Um, it's a certain what I like about quantum mechanics and um, as integrals is that. There's still a certain amount of mystery involved in quantum mechanics, and um, there's a certain amount of mystery, even more mystery, involved in path integrals. And uh, so, let me see. One, two, four. I've got my eight and my notes all mixed up here. Five. Let's screen up for a moment. So, Z takes a very physical way of looking at this. Um, suppose, he says, suppose you have a source and you imagine something like a two-slit experiment and then you have a screen, well, you know that what you do is you compute the amplitude for this and then the amplitude for that, and if this is A1 and this is A2, then the total amplitude A is A1 plus A2. So, um, Z says, well, what, what about if you have uh, three holes. The length, you'll know, have this and this and that, so you have A1, A2, A3. And so now you 
add the amplitude. That's the basic rule of quantum mechanics, is that you add the amplitude. And um, you can next think about a more complicated situation where you have where you have, say, a double double slit experiment. So you've got this. So you basically got uh, four different amplitudes, and so the total amplitude is a one plus a two plus b three plus four. So the that's the way of thinking about it. And now you can imagine well, what if you what if you had even more holes? Start putting all kinds of holes here, and pretty soon all you have is the source and the screen. And so the amplitude here is evidently something that would be like that. And then you add this one in, and then you add this one in, and then you add that one in, and then this one, and so forth. So you wind up adding together all the amplitudes. So the total amplitude is the sum of all the amplitudes, and of course it's a some j equals zero to infinity. And so that's the basic idea of path integrals. The, I think it occurred first to Dirac. In fact, it's really amazing the number of things that Dirac invented. Um, uh, just amazing. Anyway, so, and moreover, he, he in fact did have this basic idea of path integrals. He didn't do a great deal with it, he just sort of formulated it, and then Feynman, and uh, in fact Feynman in his PhD thesis, um, uh, started to develop path integral seriously. And, um, so that's, that's something that's very humbling to, to think about, that um, his PhD thesis invented developed animals. All right, so let me let me just sort of do it in this way. The first the first idea is that if we have some final state and then e to the minus h t, we want to compute this. Well what it's going to be is it's going to be obviously it's QF e to the minus i h dt minus i h dt dot 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 d minus i h dt times q i. And here we can think of dt as big T over n and we're imagining that n sort of goes to infinity. So and, and so that's sort of obvious and kind of trivial, but it becomes less trivial when you write this as a product, j equals 1 to n minus 1 integral dqj. And now we've got qf e to the minus ih dt qn minus 1 qn minus 1 e to the minus ih dt n minus 2 times n minus 2 e to the minus i h t n minus 3 dot 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 and the last one is basically p1 e to the minus i h t uh, so you just put in complete sets of states and in fact the notation for putting in complete sets of states is also something you rank inventor. Um, that is to say, you've got the identity operator is an integer to use. If you have a, essentially, he said something like a column vector, we can write as, suppose this is a column vector, we can 
write that like this as what he called a cat. But then he introduced something that nobody had, a notation that nobody had used, namely that this thing is a bra, V. And in fact, it's this, it's this vector complex conjugate is this bra. And by, consider, by considering this thing, and the way he wrote it is bra het would be, for example, uh, so this is the bra C het bracket. We put it this as a bracket. And um, so that allows one to write, as, it, as you do in quantum mechanics, out of products of um, of, uh, of and so on. And I'm going to depart a little bit just trivially from Z in using what's the conventional notation. For some reason, Z changes the normalization by square root of 2 pi on his P's. But this is the conventional notation of quantum mechanics. And what you have is Q prime, P prime then is E to the I, Q prime, P prime over square root of Q pi. So this is the conventional normalization that's used in quantum mechanics. So I, I don't see any point in renormalizing the, the uh, piece. By the way, I forgot to invite questions. Anytime you have a question, just shout out question, okay? And in fact, I forgot to bring chocolate. I usually give people chocolate if they, if they um, uh, ask a question. Um, and I've got the chocolate uh, in my office. Let me go get it. Um, <laughs> so just think about this. So I've got the chocolate, so now if you want to ask a question, you get a chocolate. <laughs> the first time I did this, the first question was, what kind of chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> Notice how this all this makes sense. Namely, we ex our normalization is Q prime Q is delta Q prime minus Q. And you guys have all used delta functions, right? Um, and so now we can think of this as Q prime, the identity Q. So this would be an integral, for example, dp Q prime P. P, Q. By the way, this X doesn't really mean X. It's rather that there's a bra here and a pet there. And so you can imagine a tiny bit of space, but it's just so much easier to write X. So in other words, this is the same thing as easy to write x as long as you don't have an x in the formula. All right, using this expression, this is equal to an integral dp over 2 pi e to the i q prime minus q times p. And of course, this is an expression for delta of q minus prime minus q. OK. Um, let me just remind you of something. Uh, the some people write write hats on P's to make them operate. Mm -hmm. That's a little heavy on the notational side. So this thing is P prime Q P prime, and on the other hand. Um, this is P 
e prime e to the i q p prime over the square root of 2 pi. And now we see that this is um, 1 over i d d q of um, q p prime. So this gives us the identification of p with 1 over i d d q. Or if we put back in h bar, p is h p is h bar over i h bar over i d by d q. So you see what our, our notation is consistent. All right, so now we're going to try to do the patent before the simplest case. And um, in fact, I think this is one of the clever things about Z's book is that it hurts. Pat integrals, he sidesteps one of the theoretical complexities of pat integrals by considering the pat integral to a free particle. Any questions? Remember, I have to tell you <laughs> So what we're thinking about now is we're going over here and we're going to be computing these factors that occur in this integral. And um, so qj plus 1, e q minus i, p squared over 2m, this is the operator, dt qj. So what is this? Well, we just inserted complete sets, uh, a complete set of p states, d p prime over 2 pi. No, no 2 pi. Dp prime, qj plus 1, e to the minus i, p squared dt over 2m, uh, p prime, p prime, qj. These are my distance glasses. I'm going to put on my reading glasses and do better. And so now we remember this formula here. And so we get this as integral dp prime now over to pi, the p on p prime replaces p by p prime. So this is e to the minus i p prime squared over 2m dt. And then the inner product, maybe I should not skip a step. This is dt prime then e to the minus i p prime squared dt over 2m. And now qj plus 1 p prime, p prime, qj. And now I'm saying that this, we just have two factors here, and this is e to the i, qj plus 1 minus qj times p prime. OK, so now we have we reduced this factor to a simple uh, Gaussian integral. Now, I ordinarily just say that you sh should just look it up or use um, Wolfram Alpha or something to figure it out. But um, because Gaussian integrals are so important in physics, I'm going to go through the elementary mathematics now. So are there any questions? Though? Yeah. Um, if you're just doing the like free particle propagator, does it matter a lot whether you use like a relativistic versus non-relativistic kind of thing? I, I, I didn't hear the last part of the question. Um, does it matter very much whether you're using like a relativistic versus non-relativistic? Oh thing? yes. Oh okay. Oh yes yes. All right so. Oh, I'm a little bit confused as to how you. I mean. In the second equation on the board, that board, you had a e to the negative i p squared dt over two. Here? Uh, one to the right? Yeah. The exponential, you had a p squared, and then suddenly it changes to a p prime. Yes, yes. P is the operator. Right. 
And when the and this P, P, the state the ket P prime is an eigen ket of the operator P. So in other words, P P prime is equal to P prime P prime. Just as Q the operator on Q J say is Q J times the state Q J. Okay. Any other questions? It's very confusing not to put a hat on. Say it again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could have put hats on these. And actually, Z does. But I don't know. I never like that. That's a rotation. Here, so that was you, right? That wasn't the question. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> All right, so let me just uh, give you a couple of, um, I'm going to say some simple things about Gaussian integrals. This is actually a trick introduced by some famous mathematician, but I forget who it was. Shout it out if you know. Um, So you consider this Gaussian integral, and if you want to do this Gaussian integral, what you do is you write g squared is equal to dx dy e to the minus a half x squared plus y squared. And now you notice that this is an integral over the whole plane. And so this thing is an integral 0 to infinity 2 pi r dr minus r squared over 2. And now you notice that you, you set w equal to r squared over 2, so dw is uh, r dr, and so this is an integral of 0 to infinity dw e minus w, but this is 2 pi left over, so this is 2 pi. So this original integral here the square root of 2 pi. Alright, so I've used up all the black ones that are split in front of me. Shortage of uh, erasers. One eraser in this big room. Ah, okay, thanks. play with this uh, expression. In particular, if you just shift x by, say, b, you get e to the minus a half x minus g squared dx. This is still square root of 2 pi. On the other hand, it's also equal to e to the minus b squared over 2 times an integral e to the minus a half x squared plus dx. And so we have the rule with minus infinity plus infinity minus a half x squared plus bx dx is e to the b squared over 2 or, uh, times square root of 2 pi. Because these are, I, I don't mean to say these are profound results, but they're used so much in physics that it's worth seeing how simply one can derive them. And now if we let x go to square root of a times x, we get square root of a integral dx e to the minus a half ax squared uh, plus square root of a bx equals e to the half b squared 
root too high. And, or equivalently, uh, using up this blackboard really quickly, e to the minus a half a x squared plus square root of a b x equals e to the half b squared square root two pi over a. And now you let square root of a b equal to c, and you have integral dx e to the minus a over two x squared plus cx equals e to the c squared over 2a squared of 2 pi over a. So this is just about as general as you need. But now I'm going to make a couple of changes of variables. and you get integral dx e to the minus a over 2 x squared plus ij x equals e to the minus j squared over 2a squared over 2 pi over a. Now you can also let a go to i minus i a and you get integral dx minus the plus infinity e to the i a over 2 x squared plus i j x equals e to the minus i j squared over 2 a squared of 2 pi i over a. This is the form that we're going to use immediately, but um, next, uh, in the next class, I'll use this form. This one uh, uh, is obviously a much tamer expression mathematically because it's a decaying exponential. All right, now. Okay, so now let's go back to the expression that we had in the upper right-hand corner of that blackboard there. And so, what we've got, maybe I'll take advantage of this space here and I'll write it as qj plus 1 e to the minus i over 2 p squared dt over m qj. And this is then integral dp prime over 2 pi e to the minus i p prime squared minus i over 2 and then dt over m e to the i qj plus 1 minus qj p prime. So that's our expression. Here a is equal to dt over m and j is qj plus 1 minus qj. The reason for this j notation is that j is often a so-called external current or source. And so now just um, applying this formula and taking into account that we have an extra 2 pi what we get is, I'm going to skip a step in the notes. I'll put these notes online. It's going to be e to the i m is a minus i over 2 m qj plus 1 minus qj over dt squared times dt. And then the square root of minus i m over pi dt. All right, so that's our basic expression. Notice I did something sort of 
apparently silly here, the thing actually gives us, <coughs> it's just j squared over 2a, but, and a is dt over m, but what I did was I multiplied by dt and divided by dt, that way I got something that looks like a derivative here. So in other words, this thing looks like but there's still an integral, right? Huh? There's still an integral sign. We're still integrating over qj plus 1 and qj. Yeah. All right, so you get a... You get a... Uh, so, so this is e to the i, m over 2. It's effectively q dot squared dt. And then this overall factor, minus i, m. So that's that's what this individual thing looks like if we make this identification of q dot, say if we want we can say q dot is j plus one minus q j over dt. It's q dot at this particular point in the trajectory. All right, so what is our, what is our expression then? factor is an integral over all functions of e to the action. In other words, this is an integral dq of t, e to the i integral l of q, d 
dt, or it's integral dq of t e in i s q, where this is the action functional, and the action functional is an integral 0 to t L of really Q and Q dot dt, so I should have written this as Q and Q dot. All right, so that's that's the picture that emerges. Um, so do we do we have some? Yes, a question. What is the physical significance of this result? Oh, hold on, let me put it on. Now what? Oh, it's enormous. It's everything. I mean, it's all the quantum and it's all the classical physics. Um, <laughs> so, in other words, an amplitude is an integral over all the paths of e to the i times the action. Okay? Now, let's, to, to pre- to, to, to derive the classical part, let me put, let me go from natural units back to MKS units. Well, the sprinkling is very simple because the units of H bar are action. So we just put in an H bar up here. Whoop, sorry. I hope you've got very thick shoes. Yeah. Good. Um, so now H bar is in the denominator of an exponential, of the argument of an exponential, this thing is very sensitive to changes in S. Okay? And so what that means then is that, that the amplitude here to go from QI to QF in time T will be substantial only if there is one or more paths, Q of T, that go from QI to QF as T goes from zero to big T, such that this action functional is stationary. That is, so that as you make, as the path sort of quivers slightly from one path to a slightly different path, that the change in S is second order in the quivering. <laughs> All right? So in other words, the only time you get a, a, uh, a big contribution is that is when S of Q plus delta Q is equal to S of Q plus something of the order of an integral delta Q squared dt. And that tells you then that the trajectory is a big only in this case, but this is the same thing as saying that the variational derivative of the action function with respect to Q of t is zero. And this thing is the same thing as the Rogers equations, which here are fairly simple. It's just Q double dot equals zero. So it moves uh, at a constant speed from zero to, uh, from time zero to time t from qi to qf. Well, there's always a trajectory that does that classically, non-relativistically. But of course, if you went to a relativistic situation, it wouldn't be, yeah. Um, so would it not be just like quite as sensitive as you would think because of the i in the exponential? I'm you're sorry, say, say saying, it again? You're saying it's sens very sensitive to the change in the action because yeah. of the exponential, but there's yeah. also an i. Yeah. So, so that's, that makes it super sensitive because you see, if you change s over h bar mm -hmm. by pi, you introduce a minus sign, you get complete cancellation. So that's the sense in which it is sensitive. In a little while, maybe at the end of this hour or on Wednesday, I'll do the case where instead of computing this amplitude, we take away the i. Then it's just a statistical mechanical factor, e to the minus h times something, like e to the minus h or kt. 
then uh, we'll have an e to the minus something like s, but it will actually be energy and energy. Um, and then, uh, then we'll have a somewhat different argument. But the I accentuates the, uh, the um, sensitivity because of this cancellation. And notice that this also tells you when quantum mechanics sets in. Quantum mechanics sets in when you're dealing with processes whose action is so small that they often that when you make a change in the process, S doesn't change by pi, or, or S over H bar doesn't change by pi. It only changes a little bit. So then you're in a total quantum regime. Um, if I can remember right, in classical mechanics, the path to the minimum action is the one that something would take. You know, as like a trajectory, right? Or like that. So, right. So, 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 the thing that makes the quantum and, and here though stationary is the station is a, is whether there's available a path of stationary action. But I mean, in here though, other paths seem to actually have a bit of amplitude, although. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they are, they have a they have neighbors that cancel them. Let me, um, let me say that I yeah, actually yeah, yeah. Um, got, I, I forgot I, about I, the I, interference. I skipped a concept, so it would be good for me to go, but it was prompted by your question, actually. Um, let me get back to this concept. Let's, um, so Bob in considering Three particle, where H is just P squared over 2M. So now let's go to H equals P squared over 2M plus V of Q. So now what we have is Q of J plus 1, E to the minus I, H, P, P, Q, J. What is it going to be? Well, it's, let's see, do I have, I didn't put anything in the way of explanation. Um, so let me, so I've got the chalk, let's put in an extra step here. E to the minus i, p squared over 2m, dt, minus i, v of q, dt, Qj. So this is what we're computing. Now, what we're imagining here is the dt is so small, we're taking the limit as dt goes to zero, dt is so small that we can write these two things as like that. In other words, as a product of the two exponentials. That's because the dt is so super small. The difference here is of order dt squared. Now we insert a complete set of states, p prime, and we integrate. And now you can see what happens. This factor and this factor, the only difference is this is qj. So we get our old formula which is integral dp prime over 2 pi e to the minus i p prime squared over 2m dt. And then we get plus i qj plus 1 minus qj uh, p prime. And then we get minus i v of qj dt. Okay, so this is the expression now. 
Now this is the integral that we did before over p prime. There's no p prime over here. So we get the same expression, namely uh, minus i m over 2 pi dt to the 1 half, and then uh, e to the i j plus 1 minus qj over dt squared m over 2 minus b of qj, minus i, b of qj, dt. So that's what the individual terms are. But of course, we have all of them here. Uh, in other words, we have to have you know, we have the whole product of these, right? You so now, now putting together what we get is that this amplitude QF e minus I H G Q I now is integral dQ of T e to the I S of Q where now S of Q is again 0 to T L of Q and Q dot dt, which now is an integral dt 0 to T M over 2 Q dot squared minus V of Q. any questions. By the way, you also get chocolates for pointing out typos or mistakes or whatever. Yeah. You're missing an interval, I think. Say it again? I think you're missing an interval on the topmost line on that board. It's the product oh, yes. of all the intervals. Ha. Thank you. That's a nice story for chocolates. <laughs> 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 Okay, so now to get back to what you were uh, saying, what's what's physical? Well, as I said, this when will the amplitude from QI to QF be substantial? Well, only if when we put in the H bar, this thing is stationary. So now we say the variational derivative of of this should vanish, and that now gives us, or equivalently, that S of Q plus delta Q should be S of Q plus an integral of something like delta Q squared dt. And um, that means that we get Lagrange's equations, which here are m q double dot is minus uh, dv dq. So the acceleration is the force. M times the acceleration of the force. By the way, I'm going to put a couple of chat. I, I just finished writing a book, big mistake, um, on uh, mathematics for graduate students in physics. And I'm going to put a couple of chapters on the web page. Um, one of the chapters will be on variational derivatives. So, uh, in fact, I think I'll take one of the. At some point, I will explain this in more detail. This this lingo, and it's it's the subject of one of the chapters of the book. The, the notion of a variational derivative. 
And um, the other chapter is a chapter on path integrals, which I'll also put on the web page. And uh, you shouldn't think that you have to master the chapter on path integrals. Uh, certainly not at this point. You might want to say that you should master the chapter on path integrals when you, by the time you finish taking 524, if you decide to take 524. So it's, it's path integral chapter starts out just as I'm doing now. It starts out simply, but it keeps going. Um, it gets into things like ghosts. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, all right, let me just check the time. So we've got about eight minutes left. Let, are there any questions? All right, let me um, add a couple of details. First the statement, this, this, this thing here, you may say this is a little bit wacky. And um, because when you think about this thing, it really, dt is t over big N. So this is something like minus i m n over 2 pi t raised to the power n over 2. So this is really, really bizarre. It's uh, a factor of i times a number that's going to infinity raised to the power of infinity over 2. So this is really, really bizarre. However, if you take ratios of path integrals, these crazy factors out in front cancel. And in particular, if you are considering e to the minus ht, then uh, not only do they cancel, but, but it makes enormous sense to take ratios of path integrals. So I'll, I'll explain that on Wednesday or in a later like That's one way of taking the the, the really of calming the, the most bizarre features of uh, path integrals. Anyway, all right. Let's let's first imagine this. Suppose we have a final state and an initial state. And what's that? Well, that's dqf dqi fqf qf e to the minus i h t q i q i the initial state and if we use the ordinary notation of quantum mechanics then this is dqf dqi psi f star qf uh, dq of t I, S, and U. By the way, the square, square bracket is because S is a functional of Q. That is to say, it's something that turns a function Q into a number. It's the action of the process Q of the T. And if, if F and I are the ground state of the theory, then we've got something that we can call Z of T. And um, we normally say that Z is basically the limit T goes to infinity. All right, so that's, we've gotten basically to the end of my notes. Um, so let me, let me, let me invite more questions, but if there aren't questions, then I'll start something new. So we've got four minutes, does anybody have a, yeah. Does the whole thing only works when it's on the, uh, uh, sorry, commute with, 
each other in different time frame? No, no, that's not necessary. And usually the, the Hamiltonian, uh, well, let's see, what does this even mean? There's only one Hamiltonian. And it's time independent, so it does commute with itself at different. So you're saying the Hamiltonian has to be time independent. Ah, oh, all right. Um, now that's that, that, let's let's think about that. I don't think. Well, I. No, I think we can. I think we can do the same thing. I think we can do the same thing with a time dependent Hamiltonian. At least if the. If the time dependence is due to some classical function that's involved there. But don't we have a Dyson series? Huh? If don't we have a Dyson series if it's time dependent? Yeah. Well, see, I, I didn't quite hear what you were saying, but for example, we could do the following J of T, Q of T. We could add a term like that to the Hamiltonian, to which J of T is something, some function that you define. It's time, the function of time, and then we could go through this whole thing, and it would, it would, uh, would work fine if J is classical, certainly. And that's the normal case in which a Hamiltonian is time dependent. You throw in some classical term that we vary, right? about to say like electromagnetic radiation. Well, I mean, you know, if we're doing quantum electrodynamics, we have a Hamiltonian that would not depend on time, and we go through all of this, it would just be a, it'd be a field theory rather than quantum mechanics. That's two questions. Oh. Because, uh, <laughs> too much. <laughs> yeah, I, by the way, I, I throw out chocolate because um, I don't know of any easy way to throw out fruit. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't really encourage you to uh, eat. Uh, a lot of sugar. It's 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 not good for you. Um, and and let me say something else. The worst possible thing is to smoke cigarettes. <laughs> God says, don't smoke. Um, uh, let's see. Maybe I can buy some nuts. A lot of people are allergic to this. A lot of people really? Oh. All right, who's allergic to nuts? So I, I hate them. Don't, don't did you put yes. butter in them? You don't like them. I just hate them. It's not now that you say. What I can do is maybe I'll well when I run, I'll I'll use up these chocolates, but I'll bring some nuts and then if you you can say if you want if you're allergic I'll throw you a nut. I mean, I'll put it All right, any, any more questions on this? All right, I think you'll find Z's book, um, I hope you find it fun to read. It, it, Z has somehow the idea in his head that he's written it simply enough, simply enough for an undergraduate to understand. I think he's nuts. Um, <laughs> It's, um, it's like Feynman's uh, introductory physics books. They're great for postdocs, but not so good for freshmen in physics. Um, so Z's book, um, what you should do if, 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 as you read it is um, mark the places that you find confusing and then ask me in class, and I'll try to explain those things to you. This is a pretend This is a non-physics question. Um, is it in a bookstore? Uh, no, it isn't. I've been at war with the bookstore for about 20 years. Um, it, the reason is that I found that when I would tell the bookstore what book I was going to use, they'd order it and they wouldn't give a damn 
about getting the latest printing. And so, you see, what happens is if you have a book that's successful, then the publisher and the author correct the typos in subsequent printing. And so when you get to the latest printing of any given edition, you have a book that's relatively clean. And I was finding that the books that uh, the bookstores were selling, for example, there was a book on mechanics, uh, Goldstein's book on mechanics. I, I don't know if it's still popular, but it was then for many years. And uh, I had a copy that was seven years old, and it was more recent than the one the bookstore was selling. And so for that reason, I've, um, and I tried to get the bookstore to uh, to order the latest printing, but they didn't even have a space on their form, which of course was computerized, and therefore perfect. Um, but they didn't even have a place on their form to put latest printing. So they just, they just ask it, and they just order the book, and I imagine they didn't even get it from the publisher, they'd get it from some distributor, and the distributor would say, oh, this is UNM, we'll send them the old shit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't mean that it's UNM, but the form didn't specify the printing, so we'll get rid of the old stuff. I don't know. I, I don't. Anyway, uh, so I. But if you want, I'll tell the bookstore to order the latest. But uh, I think Amazon would give you the latest printing uh, because they order stuff, sell it, they order more stuff, sell it, and so you get stuff that's fresh like vegetables, you get fresh vegetables at the store that sells a lot. So the thing is that, well, is there any, uh, a Igor sign? All right, can you give me that again? Where? So, the, oh, the last one. The last one. Yeah. Is there an Igor sign? There's an Igor sign here. There's an Igor sign here. Uh, an integral sign. Uh-huh. Yeah, the integral uh, sign. No, no, we so, didn't integrate. This is QJ, 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 QJ plus one is the integral of a P prime, and we've got just these QJs there. But there's no more integral here. We have the integral of a P prime yeah. here. That gives us this. Okay. You need two hands, I think. Whoop. Well, that's the problem with nuts, they're on the floor. These things are wrapped, so... All right, any other questions? Or we just... All right, I urge you all to complain to the chairman. This room is air conditioned. And after you hear more than five of you, can do something. All right, so...